Excellent. Thanks, Aaron. I uh, hope everyone can hear me okay. And thanks for having Brightcore join us. I was so excited when uh, Christina McPike from WinCo asked us to present on geothermal systems. We've been working with her a little bit from our side on the Brightcore company. And I've known Christina and actually James Peterson, who's also uh, joining us today from Peterson Engineering for decades, I feel. Uh, I started my my experience and my journey in Passive House and sustainability way back before Passive House was uh, kind of a thing in the United States. Uh, I worked for Stephen Winter Associates for ooh, about 14 years uh, as a director of multifamily systems. I worked very closely with Lois, who I'm sure you all have heard of at Stephen Winter Associates. Um, so I've been working on Passive House projects for a long time. I helped build the the testing at Cornell Tech at Roosevelt Island when it was the tallest passive house building. Obviously, that's now uh, been surpassed, which is excellent. So super happy to be here. Presented quite a bit at the Passive House Network conferences. We just did a recording for the one that was in Denver a couple months ago. So again, so excited to be here to talk to you about geothermal. When I came over to Brightcore about two years ago, I said, listen, guys, we need to pivot and really talk through multifamily new construction opportunities with geothermal. When I came over, we were more on the CNI side of things, doing more of the, the higher ed campus type of district systems, which we are still doing. But I said, look, there's a, a real uh, opportunity here to put all electric geothermal ground source heat pumps into multifamily buildings, in particular affordable housing. I had seen it when I was working at doing the Beach Green Dunes project with L&M, who kind of were the pioneers of doing affordable housing geothermal systems at the time. So I said, there's a real opportunity here. We can save on our loads with domestic hot water, et cetera, et cetera. We'll get into the technical details shortly. Um, and since then, we've we've worked with a lot of developers. We're, we're installing a lot of ground source heat pumps in these affordable housing multifamily projects. And they're all past top. So it's super exciting. We'd love to talk more about what's going on in Massachusetts. We have a few opportunities up there as well. Um, but before I hand it over to Jonathan, again, Lauren Hildebrand here, Stephen, uh, Senior Vice President of Strategic Partnerships. And we really just want to give you a quick, you know, deep dive one-on-one -on, -one on geothermal systems. Please feel free to interrupt us as we go through all of the slides. We have, I know we have a ton of questions. James has some really exciting ones about uh, our drilling techniques and, and geology, which Jonathan is an expert in, so you're in good hands there. Um, but again, Jonathan, if you want to share your screen while uh, you pull that up, Brightcore, just a quick company overview. We are about nine years young now. Uh, we started in more lighting and solar uh, previously before we got into the, the geothermal world. Um, but we are a turnkey energy solutions provider. We've done a, a ton of work on the Mid-Atlantic up through the Northeast Corridor really focusing on renewable and decarbonization goals for our clients. And again, we've done some big lighting projects like JetBlue. We've done some solar work in the community solar programs, particularly in, in New Jersey. But what's really been exciting is, is this geothermal front. You know, it wasn't even a, a thing when I first started in terms of it being affordable. And we'll talk through some of those incentives as well. But with the IRA funding, with the state and local incentives on top of doing it in a passive house building, it really is uh, affordable, which is one of those myths that we're continually to debunk. So again, feel free to interrupt us. We're happy to talk through more of what our company does at the end. Um, but really, our focus here is geothermal, how it works, where it works best, and what the type of equipment looks like from the heat exchanger up into the building and then how it pairs really well with Passive House. So again, feel free to interrupt us. And with that, I will turn it over to Jonathan. Thanks again for having us. Thank you very much, Lauren. Wow, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a tough uh, tough intro to follow. I <laughs> um, appreciate it though. So good evening, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be presenting to you guys, talking about something that I can talk a lot about on end and perhaps ad nauseum, that's geothermal. Uh, and here at Brightcore, my role here development. I'll go briefly over a little bit about Brightcore uh, to add on to what Lauren's already mentioned. And then the focus is to discuss the construction of the ground loop and then have a kind of step-by-step -step with 
you know, images and explanations on not only the drilling and the installation of the wells, but some of the technology that is kind of on the forefront of the industry, um, borehole thermal energy storage, and how that can also relate to passive house efficiency and maximizing the opportunity uh, of utilizing ground source heat pumps. We also uh, will discuss some case studies where we've even used hybrid systems with air source heat pumps in order to optimize even during the shoulder seasons, not the peak seasons, and then the installation. And then it's uh, then it's a free for all. And we all get to talk geothermal for the rest of the meeting. So <laughs> fun time. Um, again, as Lauren mentioned, if you guys have any questions or comments, I believe uh, there's already a chat window up. So don't be shy to use it. All right. Yes, so we're on our way. Um, as mentioned earlier, we are a one-stop shop for energy efficiency today, obviously geothermal heating and cooling, uh, as opposed to power and electricity generation. And you know, I will touch a little bit on that just because there is a big difference in scale and obviously in, in product. Uh, LED lighting with a legacy in that, as well as uh, community solar, battery and EV charging. Um, you see that we are based mostly in New York, but with the center of excellence in Stockholm, Sweden, and that'll be important later on in the, in the presentation, as I'll touch on, on some of our collaboration with Scandinavia. Our leadership is uh, Mike Richter. Uh, you may know him as the NHL star, but he's a green energy uh, renewable star as well. He's been, been in the company and in renewable energy for many, many years. And Robin Constantine uh, co-founded bright core uh, as uh, so you know that's that's where our company began and uh, my background is engineering geology and geology specifically subsurface characterization and modeling within geothermal uh, my experience goes from well site and field geology project management and then even risk mitigation, working in, in funding multilateral banks and public sector uh, type of um, financing. So that's a little bit of my, my history. I've been in geothermal for just a uh, hair under 15 years. And have, as I like to say, before it was chic. And it's, it's great to see this renaissance in the geothermal world. So uh, I'm, I'm very kind of uh, keen on marrying as many industries to geothermal. And, and I really think that multifamily housing and just construction development in general is gonna be so well integrated and coming from the power sector on how they've done with lithium and, and green hydrogen and things like that. I think there's a real opportunity and uh, looking forward to discussing the technology. Now, Lauren or Aaron, I don't see the chat window on my screen. So, and I do see the number four. So if things pop up, you know, feel free to jump in. Yeah, I'll, me, I'll, field those, I'll field those for you, Jonathan. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. I appreciate that. Okay, so uh, the background on, on how we actually get the work done is with the engineering and design, which we'll discuss, especially borehole thermal energy storage, but also in the drilling. And so we have our own rigs, and we'll discuss on what type of rigs are used and, and how these different types of wells are constructed, whether it's inclined, vertical, test wells, the thermal conductivity testing, and then the installation and retrofitting as well as new builds. So we uh, have within here the typical rigs that are used in geothermal from left to right. Now, the, the larger rigs are rated to down to 2,000 feet, although uh, there is a bit of a, a game to play just because of the pumping pressure. The deeper you go, you, there's a bit of a drop off in efficiency in terms of the, the the parasitic load. And we like to stay within 10 to 15% um, in terms of the energy, uh, in terms of BTU versus the actual energy of the pump. And so we try to minimize parasitic load. So we can go down to 2000 and that would be interesting for some testing uh, of thermal gradients or at least establishing the baseline thermal gradient as well as geology. And then the track mounted rigs in the middle are more of the classic style. Now there's vertical, there's incline, there's other types of geothermal uh, where there's open loop where you actually leave the wellbore column open to water or there's a uh, horizontal trenching with, with loops um, in the trenches. Today we'll be discussing a closed loop, fully grouted borehole field. And, and I say borehole as opposed to well, just because within the nomenclature of drilling and in permitting is really important. And I think that'd be a good thing to hear to kind of establish is bores 
are holes that are then filled up and do not communicate with the reservoir. Whereas wells, you are either injecting and or removing, i.e. pumping, fluid out of the reservoir. And so that is not the case in our closed loop solution, hence closed loop versus open loop. And some of the things that happen with access to an aquifer, such as water table, changes in lithology, chemical reactions, permitting, et cetera, um, are not the route that we're going to be discussing today. They do exist um, probably in earlier chapters of the technology, but I think we're fifth generation geothermal when it comes to heating and, and integration of, of energy systems. So moving it comes to retrofitting in subcellars in essentially tight quarters and, and there's some examples here on, on how this is maximized whereas the right hand side more mobile re reduces mobilization fees and time really and maximizes depth and it's just the ideal standard and water well technology uh, and drillers and things uh, within that industry crossover well uh, and then the same could even go for geotechnical industries and CPT type boring and and that type of in, you know soil and mechanical work um, could also cross over. But in terms of the well construction now, it becomes a lot more specialized. Uh, just you know to to kind of give everybody the same starting point, uh, we've got fill and we've got bedrock, or geologically what we consolidated versus consolidated. Uh, examples like sand, silt, clay, and those are organized by grain size and structure. And then you've got hard bedrock. And really the difference there is the density. And density is directly uh, related to uh, thermal conductivity. And the idea in thermal conductivity is that it can either store or transfer heat energy. I, I apologize if, if some of the background noise there. Uh, but uh, the idea there is that it's able to hold, move, or what we, instead of moving, we say diffuse the, the heat energy. And so once the first hole is made to avoid what we call sloughing or the hole collapsing on itself, we can case off with steel casing, usually schedule 40, um, typically down to the bedrock and within the bedrock. And then from there, continue to drill uh, so that we can then run high density polyethylene tubing. Now this tubing is, is really, it's pipe, it's, it's flexible, it's durable. And once it's in place, uh, depending on the location now in, in Massachusetts, it's a little different than for example, New York, whereas New York usually was about 499 feet uh, or you needed a mining permit. Whereas Massachusetts uh, limit restrictions are, are not as strict as they are in New York. But again, the drop off in terms of pumping power versus how much actual en energy is being stored or or uh, taken into this for the system. So uh, that then creates a big factor in how we assess projects in general with depth to bedrock. That's not, not to say that a geothermal system can't exist in unconsolidated. It can because there's various types of exchangers. Um, there's Rigan systems. There's braided systems. There's two, two, two loops, you know, two in and two out that can be done in terms of the design, but this is more of a generic for explanation purposes. And what you'll see in bore fields, you know, either offset in rows and the vertical field that then the loops come up would connect via lateral trenching, backfilling. And these are set it and forget it, right? The, these are all then piped over to a manifold that can be uh, manipulated and run uh, as needed and i don't want you to think that it's one large loop going in and out of every single hole these are circuits or branches you know think of it more as a, as a tire with various spokes and what that does is that it allows to maintain the the reservoir really it's, it's a heat reservoir in balance with the building systems and uh, needs whether it's cooling or heating dominated and that allows for placement and um you know, it's it's really accounting at the end of the day of therms in and therms out or tons in and tons out. And what the branches and the circuits give us is a flexibility to A, monitor performance, 
uh, but B, to compartmentalize in, in when it's needed. So, you know, and that's just obviously another uh, instructional figure for everyone's understanding. Now, some cases are not vertical. This is an area that was done uh, as you can see by the sitemap with a lot of infrastructure, you know, such as a university campus or a shopping mall or just a, a city, you know, square block. And from a specific path, uh, various angled boreholes can be done to then from a bike path, create over a football field and a half of thermal mass. And that's important because tonnage is dependent in some respect, well, not well, yeah, directly actually on the ex the amount of exposure time to the to the bedrock or to your reservoir rock, and what that means is that even though measured depth at an angle is longer than your true vertical depth, um, you're actually maximizing load and tonnage. So think of it as the vertical position is your least distance, and an angled vertical uh, an angled bore will provide more bang for your bore as it were and uh what that does is it minimizes surface disturbance so instead of two blocks uh, is for example excuse or or even thoroughfares where there is a lot of residences, whether it's a parking lot or, or a green space, you know, these are things that are being done to... Hey, Jonathan, you're breaking up a little bit if you maybe just want to repeat the Basically, last minimize the impact and maximize the output. Sorry, because that, that way the slides will take, take center stage. Jonathan, Let me know if that helps, and that should probably... Jonathan, can you hear me talking? Yes, yes, Lauren. Can you hear me now a little bit yeah, better? Yeah, sorry. I know you're you're stuck uh, in traffic. Um, <laughs> you're just breaking up a little bit. If you want to maybe just repeat the last two sentences, that would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, what I was mentioning was that we're maximizing output while minimizing surface impact by using these angled bores. A, because you can access more thermal mass or you know chunk of rock as it were but also because of the angles you're longer at the same depth than a vertical bore and because exposure to the reservoir rock is directly related to the tonnage that you can achieve per borehole now it's uh, you know as an engineer i'm not one to throw out numbers you know just like that it's case by case depends on the exchanger depends on the delta temperature with the surface but you know, there's 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 a good range that you can get. Now, there's some boreholes that can get you two, three, four tons. There's others based on the design that can, you know, I've heard of 10 or 15 and depth and geology and again, ambient temperature and other factors. But uh, this is one way to to really maximize large buildings that have larger loads that can be supported. Um, we've gotten projects where we're talking hundreds and hundreds of loads. Now, this is an example of using that angle drilling technology and the reservoir rock to do what's called borehole thermal energy storage. Uh, this is in Sweden and it was done with angle drilling. As you can see here, they were able to get out of their footprint. I'm not saying that's always the case, <laughs> but what, what this did is you can see the circuits as they line up uh, almost in a spoke pattern to then create a battery. Now, in geothermal, we love passive housing. <laughs> the efficiency, the, the, the envelope is so efficient that it really reduces, A, the number of holes, A, therefore cost, um, but B, the electrical load. Um, air source heat pumps, we're not against them in any way. Uh, ground source heat pumps have their advantages. For example, right now, uh, it's I'm staring at what's saying about six degrees Celsius. Um, air source heat pumps to heat up a room, pulling heat out of six degrees centigrade air is not as efficient as you would have down below within a ground source heat pump to remove heat that is constantly roughly between 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Like 12 to 17 Celsius. 
And what this does is it allows us to use these pockets while we use heat. Then we have a, 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 uh, a heat sink essentially for later. What we've done here at this particular site, and as we've even done it in New York, is to use air source heat pumps in combination with ground source heat pumps so that whoever's winning the efficiency battle at that time takes over. So we can pre-charge the bedrock using air source heat pumps during the shoulder seasons, and therefore in the peak seasons, use ground source heat pumps where the COPs are four, five, six, and air source heat pumps COPs are one, two, and especially because of the baseload nature of this, we can now use this for longer at lower peak time. We're using the heat from August in November, but we're running the pumps at night off peak. So it's it's an electrical load efficiency. It's a it's a thermal load efficiency, and it's a long game kind of a kind of a future proofing that that is being done. And connect this with a district size project thermal energy networks where you're moving loads around a community or around a campus or around a, uh, you know, a, a large multifamily housing development that can all be done relatively efficient, A, because of the envelopes and passive housing, but B, because ground source heat pumps have those efficiencies on record. Um, they don't have to be 80 <laughs> boreholes. They can be a dozen. And this is an example that was done uh, here with Brightcore and NYSERDA to do a proof of technology. And so we had to get it into a small tight location with the mini rig and brought it down through the, sh through the service elevator, uh, then lowered on pulleys into what used to be the coal room, uh, ironically. <laughs> and so from there, we were able to employ that same design, but now in Manhattan Schist. You know, which is just as dense as the Cambridge Argolite uh, up in up in the Boston Peninsula. You know, you're looking at 2.9, maybe a 3.1 grams per cubic centimeter hard rock uh, mafic. So it's rich in minerals. So that helps thermal conductivity in a lot of ways. And what we have in the New York example here is a we lowered our, our greenhouse gas emissions, but we were also just more efficient by reducing the peak electricity, as I mentioned during the winter season, because it's two thirds lower than just using your classic air source heat pump chiller. The other thing that's really cool is that with ground source heat pumps, I'm <laughs> sorry for being so, so casual, but I, I really think this stuff is really neat. And so one of the things that we've, able to, we've been able to do for areas in residential communities especially is remove the cooling towers and now create even more green space and open space on rooftops that can be used in employing ground source heat pumps really in the basements or the sub cellars of these buildings. So this was uh, the American example of that borehole thermal energy storage and uh, a little bit more on just the minimal disruption. Uh, this example was using that mini rig next to a museum and they put in seismometers. Actually, a couple of days before the drilling started, they wanted to have their own you know, disturbance test. There's valuable artifacts and, and collections inside that place. And anytime you say drilling, people get nervous and, and that's natural. So turns out it was just on, on the same level as a Saturday worth of foot traffic. Um, one of the ways that's, well, this actually goes through the installation process. This is once you've connected with the high density polyethylene pipes to the manifold on the right. And this is what is then controlled with software so that each branch and each circuit is working as it needs to, to again, maximize efficiency, decarbonize obviously, and we're aware that it's an electrical solution. Uh, but to do that, to play that, and, and one of the reasons we think utilities are so interested is that it's, you know, actually reduces load on the electricity as well. And that just, you know, makes everyone thrilled especially the utility companies, but also just um, people in the multifamily space, people in the, in the commercial space, nonprofit space. It's a, it's a real concern, future-proofing. I mean, one thing is emissions laws, but the other is the reality of, of maintaining buildings and the costs associated with that. And so ground source heat pumps to geothermal have really sh uh, shined in, in, those, in those aspects.
a um, little bit more on logistics and impact. Uh, you can see in, in close quarters, uh, things can still be, whether it's, you want to say, uh, less impact, but more than anything, it's efficient. It's, it's in and out. These, these holes can be drilled within a day, a 12 hour shift, 500 feet. You know, you go further, it may take more time per hole, but you're reducing mobilization as well. It's, it's, you know, there's a, there's a crossover point between, you know, 40, 500 foot holes or 20,000 foot holes. You know, it, the rate of penetration could out, do the rate of moving over to the next hole and starting up again and grouting and, and the time it takes to run the loop and all these things. So um, that that is one thing that we've noticed in, in terms of areas where they've allowed us to drill deep, uh, Rhode Island and, and Tracy Ogden and Dave have been in the mid-Atlantic geothermal uh, industry for quarter century plus. And they've seen every regulation in the book and they'll tell you there there's times when it's just better to go shallow and, and just retrofit. There's times where if you have a rugby field or if you got a park, you know, do as do as much as you can to future proof these these loads and optimize these fields. Again, some more uh, pictures of, of actually installing the the and a close look of the manifold. It it plugs into a typical mechanical room within the HVAC system and it's this is really the last part of the set it and forget it. We test every hole per IGSPA standards, International Ground Source Heat Pump Association. There's certifications that are involved with flushing, pressure testing, and even during construction, we keep them pressurized so that if there is something, whether it's a you know somebody in another part of the construction site happens to affect the pressure, we can isolate and and fix it fairly easily. These things are rated 50 to 100 years of proper operation and maintenance. Um, I'll take a quick pause, but I'm, <laughs> any questions so far? I, uh, you know, Aaron, Lauren, if there's something from the chat that if you'd like me to address before moving on a little further more into case studies and stuff. I've, I've addressed most of the questions oh, so far. Uh, wonderful. One, one, maybe, Jonathan, there seems to be a lot of, chatter about property boundaries and lines and how to best navigate the underground system and who owns what and how we kind of stay on the property. I know we alluded to using smaller drills and doing it an incline to alleviate some of that concern and mm -hmm. why we love to work with the utilities to, to help uh, navigate the public right of way and, and access. But in general, aside from when we do our preliminary feasibility studies to make sure that we're not hitting any infrastructure or water tunnels or that nature, can you talk a little bit about property boundaries and underground utility service that we're not disrupting or some of the, right. the avenues yeah. that we go through to, to make sure that we're not stealing someone's power underneath their building? <laughs> yeah, great, great points and great questions. And the, the first part I will say is, you know, state by state, mineral rights, uh, but typically um, in, in most cases, it's within your property right, as long as you, again, don't bypass critical infrastructure. There are databases, we have them at Brightcore, where you can look up and, and find whether it's geologic mapping, infrastructure mapping, you know, water tunnels, trains, subways, gas lines, electricity lines, these are things that are all logged and then can be modeled 3D wise, just like I showed in the example on the footpath. You see all the utility lines everywhere. Um, and we still stayed within the footprint of that square block. That is done two ways. Number one is the modeling and engineering part where we take all this data. And the second part is what you see before you, which is actually doing it, right? <laughs> As they say, uh, between model and, and make, <laughs> And it's it's a it's a it's a leap. <laughs> and what happens, I come from from the larger rig world where it's what we call tricone drills. And you'll see those mostly with mud drilling. And that's three cones rotating simultaneously while that group of cones are also rotating. That rotation and torque while it rips and grabs pieces of rock and flushes them back up the hole can create a lot of deviations, especially given the weight of the pipe and, and how large that is. 
funny enough, before that drilling technology was invented, and we're talking, you know, early 20th century, this was the classic way to drill. And it's called hammer drilling or percussion drilling. And funny enough, in mining, they have to drill extremely accurately. Um, foot by foot wells are, are, are an investment. And when you're trying to find gold or copper or zinc or silver, and you know there's literally a sliver of it in the side of a mountain, you have to be precise. Um, Vassar is a globally known uh, drilling technology company. And we have in Bright Core this you know, arrow in our quiver. And what it is, is it's high frequency percussion drilling, which A, in harder rock is more accurate than the classic rotation of rotations <laughs> that I just described um, that you'll see by limiting what's called bit walk. And that rotation can create dog legs and deviations. In percussion drilling, the rotations are, are, are less, but it's really not a rotation of scraping and creating shear forces, but it's a pulverization. And I say that literally. The drill cuttings that you'll usually see on tricone are about the size of, you know, gravel, uh, you know, two peas stuck together kind of a size. This comes up like a smoothie. <laughs> it's it's literally just like what we like to call a geothermal smoothie. And what that does is two things. Um, creates a more accurate cone of confidence when you're drilling to stay within the footprint and stay away from things you don't want to intersect. But B, um, it's, it's actually uh, allowed to be done with water. So because the cuttings are so much smaller, they require less of a dense fluid to bring it back up to surface. When you're pushing something up heavier and bigger, you require mud and that's bentonite and sacks of basically clay and water. And there's a whole dewatering thing that you gotta go through. With the water hammer technology, you're accurate, you're you're fast, and you're you know safer and quieter. If you notice those guys aren't wearing earphones, they're or, uh, earbuds, they are actually drilling and it's done whether by remote that you'll see right there on the table and they have software to know their rotation speed, if you know things are getting tight or, or stuck. Um, but also we use a lot of the same technology that the big boys use in oil and gas. We have gyroscopes. You can run those down into the hole and we literally 3D model the deviations. Now, whoever tells you that a, a well can be or a hole can be perfectly straight in any direction is lying to you. That just does not happen, but you can minimize and mitigate that um, while you drill. And that's called optimization while drilling. And, and that is also part of the field uh, technology that is, that is uh, integrated into, this, into these operations. So that, that would be my short answer. <laughs> um, really, that's, that's how the technology and how the construction portions work. Um, we can talk a little bit about the incentives with ground source heat pumps for the uh, construction. We can open it up for discussion here on the technology and on, on the science side. Um, that was, that was a really great question. Oh, I see somebody. Yes. Wait, perfect. Lauren, that is correct. <laughs> We're about to touch on it now. Um, the investment reduction act uh, is a, the federal tax credit. It's, it's 30 to 50%. 30 is the base of where the, the, tax credit begins 10% if it's domestically sourced equipment in the United States and another 10% depending on the community, what they call either an energy community or uh, low income housing. And that can be another add on to that federal tax credit, which is then stackable on state and local. Uh, I, we, we know Kickstart Massachusetts from, from heat is a program. Uh, Mass Save is, is, a, is a very commonly known program. And then also the opportunities in terms of saving on future uh, legislation when you're actually, you know, modeling financially for years out with, you know, Birdo and, and other restrictions or other uh, legislation that'll be affecting code and affecting running these buildings themselves. So um, that's kind of what I had, uh, Aaron and Lauren. I, I'm happy to discuss anything that that hasn't been touched on and that maybe i can find something and, and share it with the screen I'm, I'm happy to but uh let me know um if there's a you know kind of a forum to be had i'm happy to to participate 
Thanks so much, Jonathan. That was wonderful. And again, we really wanted to set up this conversation to have a conversation, right? We we have the the slides which we'll share with everyone after the conference, but you know, it, it really is a, a back and forth. There's uh, so many questions that come up during our technical lunch and learns that we didn't really want to wait until the very end, which is kind of why I was typing away, trying to answer as many as I can, but you all have wonderful, really high level technical questions that we're happy to walk through or go back to. Um, again, with the incentives, the 50%, just to kind of talk to that, which is why I kind of capped myself at 40%, the 50%, that 10% adder, it's not very clear about low income communities, whether it's because you're building in an area that you're putting a lot of affordable housing, it's based more on if you're near, I believe, uh, like a coal, old coal mine or a gas facility, the energy community definition is slightly different than just what your typical low income tax credit would look like for building an affordable building, which is kind of why we left that off for now. <clears throat> and then the other caveat there is we, we do need to do prevailing wage on these projects. We haven't run into an issue yet, um, but that that's also something that comes up as well. And then the third comment I wanted to make about that is the, the, the benefit of this, the way this tax credit is written, it's easily transferable. So if you're a not-for-profit, you can take the credit. If you don't pay your taxes, you can use the third party to kind of move it through. So it becomes basically just a, a check when you're at the end of construction. Again, this rolls out <clears throat> and shortly in a, a month and a half, we'll start to see some of those come in. So we'll have a better understanding, but we've hired many tax experts that have, you know, A, assured us that this tax credit is not going anywhere, that it's real, and that a lot of companies that have private equity, like Brightcore, for example, can kind of offset that, that cost for you and do some bridge financing and pay for the loop up front and then work out a creative way to, to pay that back if, if you don't have the funds or you're waiting on funds from your affordable housing tax agencies. I know we're talking a lot about multifamily and we certainly can talk to commercial and higher ed as well, but that is one concern that that continuously comes up and, and we're, we're getting reassured by the IRS that that won't be an issue. So we'd love to hear cool. more Thank you, questions yeah. if you have drilling questions, uh, geology yeah, questions. I'm, I'm uh, actually going through, through the questions now. So um, I was gonna start writing, but I figured I'd just kind of go through them uh, Verbally, the ones the ones that were answered, I won't. <laughs> Thank you again, Lauren. Um, so one of the questions was on coefficient of performance on COP of the pumps themselves. The the COPs were measured. There's there's two studies. One, one that I like to cite is actually from NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, they have uh, ESIF, which is their their energy sector and innovation facility. And they did it based on yearly averages um, during those those seasons. Um, they, I'd have to go back and look, and I could show you exactly what they were citing. I'm not sure if they did a survey of people using them, and or it was a laboratory study that they may have had access to. But uh, I'd have to go back and check. And then, um, yes, it was smart to switch <laughs> without video. Sorry again about that, everyone. Um, air rotary drilling at an angle. It's not pure air. We we missed uh, with air to create a little bit more density. And at an angle, we typically use the water hammer. Um, so it's water at that point. Just A, because it's faster, you know, and but B, it, it lubricates basically that that percussion. I mean, it's it's steel on granite uh, thousands of times uh, while rotating it. It can heat up pretty quickly and, and air just won't cool it down as much. And it doesn't require as much um, pumping pressure the deeper you go. It's it's a little less because you've got a more viscous fluid than air. And um, let's see, uh, the, the manifolds and all installations. So the projects where we integrate ourselves is with the MEP who's handling the building. We are a component of the HVAC system. We can engineer and design the bore field and the wells they're, you know, they're in. However, we are mitigating a risk of installing a piece of the HVAC. That is, that is our role. So 
it really depends on whose HVAC system it is on how they want to design their mechanical room, main line, manifold. Um, the examples and the things that I've seen on site uh, has been manifolds. I will say that. Um, but I'm sure there are options. And like you mentioned, the, or you cited the Eversource example. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure we could <laughs> if, if, if it was required. But again, our bright course focus really is is on the design on the bore field and the construction thereof and then also on operation and maintenance i saw somebody mention operation and maintenance um the part of ground source and and the water and sometimes glycol but it's food grade uh glycol it's it's, it's not you know the prestone glycol it's uh is very benign but also if maintained properly has decades with minimal inspection versus Clean coils, cleaning filters, legionnaire, uh, legionnaire's um, disease inspections, uh, the upkeep of coils over time, and to be <clears> frank, I mean this is the kind of heat pump efficiency that's available on the market today. The ground loop will stay the ground loop. You can you know plug and play a different heat pump with higher efficiencies. Um, yeah, I, I was going to add also, Jonathan, yeah. that the component about cleaning and maintenance from a resiliency standpoint, right? A lot of these projects are near water or in, you know, flood proof, not flood proof zones. The the amenity spaces I know are, are super important because a lot of these buildings are built on very small lot lines. You get rid of all the rooftop equipment. You can utilize the roof in a different way. You can put solar panels, PV up there as well. It it protects the system, right? Because the system is underground and all of the equipment stays inside. So from an architectural standpoint, aesthetically, you have less holes in your wall and also great for pass pass for floor door testing. But also you can repurpose and reutilize the rooftop space because you don't have all those contention units sitting on top either. Yes. Uh, I want to you. interrupt for one moment. Uh, Lauren and Jonathan, thank you so much for the session. It's going really well and I want to keep the Q&A going. Uh, we do have a, have some people using the raised hand feature though, yes. which I don't know if you guys can see. So I just want to call out their questions here. I, uh, we have Hank. And then and then James. So maybe go go in that order here. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. yeah can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. So I have uh, two questions. One is regarding the IRA funding for some clarifications, and the other is a technical one. Uh, on the IRA, uh, my understanding is that you can also build into the credit the full system of heat pumps that are attached to the field so you can get the same 30 percent or whatever the boost is on top of that for the entire heat pump system in the building that's like correct. correct as long as the uh so yes division 23 which is distribution and and the uh any piping you know vent forced air ducts etc are all considered part of the system being serviced by the ground loop then yes, it qualifies as long as that ground loop meets a specific threshold of 75%. Yeah, that's huge. That's yeah. huge. Now, has has anybody actually done a project and taken advantage of these tax credits yet? Or was it still too new for anybody to have gone through all the steps to collect the money? Yeah, that's a great question, Hank. And I, I alluded to that. It, it kicks in, right? And it's January 2024. However, on pencil and how we're kind of pricing out these projects, it's basically quality assurance, both on whoever you decide to use, but also the IRS tax experts, right? So no one's gotten a check yet because it hasn't really fully rolled out yet. And it happens at the end of construction, but it's there. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. And we have sign off that it's real, so you can include that in your underwriting. And when you say it comes in at the end, so the tax credits, if, if people, if developers are using the tax credits to sell, like they're selling low-income housing tax credits, they're selling them after the installation, not at the beginning when they're selling other tax credits? I think you can be creative about this, right? Because you can do this transfer of, of money. I think a lot of private equity firms that are 
either underwriting it or providing the product or the service can do this bridge financing, right? So we could essentially pay for the loop, include that tax credit that you'll get back as part of that service and what that looks like. And then at the end, we would end up taking that, right? So I think you can be really creative about it. And when you're pricing out what type of equipment we want to use, that's something to consider for sure. Okay, and then the technical question I have is I, I'm not fully appreciating the air source heat pump shoulder season combination. Can can you go through that again in some more detail? Absolutely happy to, Hank. Um, so when air source heat pumps in, for example, spring and fall have a larger coefficient of performance, meaning more efficient, one kilowatt in, three out <laughs> in terms of heat. Um, it may make more sense to use the air source heat pumps in combination with ground source heat pumps as opposed to ground source heat pumps alone. And oh, you're on you're on mute. Sorry, Hank. OK, but w w why is that with the, um, the my primitive understanding is that these water source heat pumps from the geothermal well are so much more efficient than air source. I'm not quite yes. grabbing how they get understood, to understood. So yeah. it's 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 kind of a twofold thing. So the delta, the, the difference in temperature between ambient temperature and the temperature you're aiming to condition, whether it's, you know, 75 F. And if it's, uh, for example, around that same temperature outside, well, the air source heat pump bringing that temperature in is really, really easily well done. It's, it's very efficient. And in the peak seasons, like winter, there is not a lot of heat outside to bring into the home. That's when ground source heat pumps uh, are most efficient because the Delta T is almost at a, at a maximum, whether it's a scorching summer and the rock is 55 Fahrenheit, or it's, it's a crazy blizzard, it's minus you know, or it's 20, 20 degrees and the rock is still 55 F. So the air source heat pump, when it's trying to cool and it's really hot outside, is tough. And when it's really cold outside and you want to get warm, it's really hard on it as well. Whereas ground source at those times is so base load that it, that that Delta T swings around it rather than the air source trying to chase the Delta T throughout the year. So when we say the shoulder seasons is kind of where the air source can shine because the delta T is minimal. It's around where you want it to be inside anyway. Uh, it's it's not too cold. It's not too hot, right? It's 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 the middle soup for Goldilocks. <laughs> and would, and would they be would the air source at that point be handling the whole system, or would it just be a contributory? So the system would be contributory still with ground source heat pump as well. What we what we've seen is usually two to one and then three to four or three to one later on. So air source would be a third, maybe 40% in the shoulder season. And mm -hmm. what's nice is that it can pre-charge in the shoulder season when it's most efficient, grab heat and store it in the rock. And then in the winter time, the ground source heat loop can then extract that heat from that particular circuit that was being loaded all summer and, and all you know, into the fall and pull it out. And that's where the ground source heat pump efficiency skyrockets because Thank you've you. almost increased. Yeah, absolutely. You've, you've artificially increased that Delta T, which is what gives geothermal its secret sauce, the Delta temperature, you know, from and Delta T closer to zero air source. <laughs> All right. One last question. You get to combine those air source heat pumps into the tax credit for the whole system, right? I, I would have to double check on that. <laughs> Um, my understanding is that it's ground source heat pump and whatever is as associated with it in terms of distributing. Well, because the way we've set it up is it's it's another source into the heat pump uh, or rather in, in, into the exchanger or, or into the system itself. I'd have, let me double check on that and I can get back to I don't I don't want to speak out of turn. <laughs> yeah, my, my understanding is you cannot include the air source heat pumps because we're doing a water to water and it's fully renewable. That's why that would be included. Um, but that's why this is a, a, a very appealing way to utilize the tax credit because as long as your systems are using, what is it? 75%, right, Jonathan, of, of yeah. the 
the balanced hybrid systems, anything connected to the loop would be covered, but it, it can't just be the air source heat pumps alone. Yeah, I believe it's even the term is distributed. Yeah. So air source would just be another source, not part of the distribution Correct. of the ground source. Yeah. Um, we've got James and then Zachary. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Um, thank you for waiting. Well, <laughs> yeah, Lauren, nice, nice to see you again. And Jonathan, nice to meet you. So uh, there's a geologist in the house. So I have a geology question. Um, so uh, once you've hit bedrock, and I'm talking about the Northeast, maybe narrowing it to New England, maybe narrowing it to Eastern Massachusetts. So once you've hit bedrock, what's the range of conductivity? So is it a bell curve? And if it is a bell curve, um, kind of cutting off the extremes on both ends, what's the, what's the range in conductivity in most cases? The thermal conductivity would be uh, that I've seen in, in hard bedrock, metamorphic, high density, not a lot of fractures, maybe a water table would be 1.2 to 1.6 BTU per hour, especially that's our grout our, and our thermal conductivity testing is done at about 1.6 BTU per hour. And that's to get the baseline, but that's on the order order of magnitude, <laughs> definitely um, around where that would lie in a best case scenario. Now, again, it can be an alluvium where the alluvium matrix is lower but because the grout and the way it's designed in terms of the exchanger could be higher than what you would expect of it on its own as a one one loop in out. Uh, but yeah, 1.2 to 1.6 BTU out. Great, thanks. Absolutely, great question. <laughs> um, thank you for this, this has been exceptional. Um, from the passive house standpoint, what is the biggest impact to compliance with passive house that geothermal has? Is it just the reduction in EUI? Are there other impacts? And say, for example, if you're integrating geothermal into your building, does that then possibly reduce, say, the investment you have to make on the building's envelope or other aspects uh, that get you to passive house compliance? Thank you. Um, so I will talk about the EUI part uh, first. The buildings are, are, you know, designed so much more efficient than a typical building is that it allows, A, for the bore field to be smaller, but it also allows for what, well, what we've seen. Um, and what I say by that is there's a, a, project that's been modeled in-house that'll be done in, in later on next year, the it actually kind of creates a cooling dominant building because it's so efficient. <laughs> and so uh, because it's airtight, doesn't need a lot of, uh, doesn't have a big need for heating. Um, it needs more cooling loads in general. That extra cooling creates the excess heat and then actually allows geothermal, not only for heating and cooling, but also domestic hot water. Um, and so that is something that we found to be, it's so efficient that it kind of gives that bonus. Um, and it's, it allows us to take that, you know, that heating load, add it into the load from the bedrock and, and apply it towards domestic hot water. That, that'd be one of the key things that we don't typically see that we do see with passive house, um, uh, efficiencies. So, A, bravo, uh, but B, we love to see it. <laughs> so it's, it's, a uh, it's something that also is covered by the by the IRA, of course. So, uh, and then in terms of, you mentioned passive house certification. If, and perhaps if you could just uh, explain it to me one more time was, what is the obstacle geothermal has in, or, or the other way around? I apologize. I didn't quite catch that part. Yeah, and I apologize. I'm actually in the car. I'm driving home from my, my office and I wanted to attend this. So I apologize if I'm breaking up. But um, so like, the, yeah, so the impact that geothermal has on, say, a developer then complying and receiving passive house on that building. So the reduction in EUI, but, you know, there's other investments that have to be made to comply with passive house 
at least from my understanding, like investments into the building's envelope um, and, and other aspects. Because the building is using so much less energy, and this is just an idea that I have in my head, and that's why I want to ask you all's perspective. Because the building is using so much less electricity and energy because of the geothermal, would that then result in possibly less investment into, in the example that I'm thinking of right now, is the, like the building envelope? Or other aspects. That Aaron, I think yeah. you could probably answer that better. Yeah. But because the you, passive Aaron. house standard is is really about the envelope and the passive house principles. It's not it's not a um, where lead lead certification may be something you can you're kind of you can move things around as far as requirements go and still receive certification, but passive house is a is a prescription yeah that's exactly right in, in passive house i mean it's a balancing act you're going to have a, an envelope um through thermal insulation and air tightness and reduction of thermal bridging that's going to allow you to have a, a, a smaller energy demand say if we're talking about heating you're, that's going to reduce the heating demand the amount of energy you need to heat your building at the same time the equipment you're using to provide that heating so geothermal in this case uses energy to function, and, and that energy is, is really what's being measured in a passive house. We look at, say, a certain level of heating demand. Maybe in a passive house building in, in Massachusetts, your requirement might be 5 kBTUs per square foot of, of heating energy per year. That's, that's what you get. So making a really tight envelope is going to help you hit that easier. Um, at the same time, having more efficient equipment is going to help you hit that. So it's the kind of balancing act between the two. And geothermal, I mean, Jonathan, you can speak to the efficiency levels that geothermal provides. That's yes, absolutely. Thank, you. thank you so much. And well said. Thank you very much, Aaron. That that helps a lot. Um, you know, I wish I was more proficient in, in the passive house uh, sort of well prescription as it was described. Um, but yeah, I, I mentioned earlier, it's, it's so efficient. The building itself, it allows for not only heating and cooling, but also domestic hot water, which is a huge win, especially Birdo, for example, is not just emissions. It's also water usage. And it's it's about reducing carbon footprint, you know, every five years with the reporting standards and then now the performance standards. I mean, we're seeing that up and down the mid-Atlantic and, and probably on a global scale. Scandinavia is, you know, the people we work with at the Center of Excellence and they're decades ahead. And you can kind of get a glimpse into the future on thermal energy networks and things like that. Um, Hank, got oh Zach, are are you clear on the question? Sorry, or did we answer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you you all did. I, I appreciate that. That was very very helpful response. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, all right, Hank, you're up. <laughs> yeah. So I I have a question about. I've had people say aren't we just going to heat up the earth and cause climate change underground? <laughs> aren't, you know, aren't we going to unbalance the, the globe? <laughs> and which is obviously ridiculous, but I am interested in the, in the sense of how you're seasonally balancing your loads in your boreholes. So you've got, let's say you're balancing. We, we've said, we, and I would agree that we're converting a lot of these passive house buildings from a heating dominated load to an AC dominated load. So we're pulling cooling out of the earth and then we've got the heating and then we can also should be using this for hot water. Between all those three, can we keep it balanced or 20 years from now are we going to have an imbalance in the core earth temperature? Thank you, Hank. Uh, yes, I've, I've heard those. Let me get out of, out of the video. Okay, yes, I've, I've heard those same concerns. And two things. Number one, uh, we don't boil the ground. I mean, we never get to that point. You know, this isn't like the geothermal power sector. Soil germinates well at 75 or 85 F. Um, you know, it gets to a point where 120 F really begins to singe roots and, and dry things out more than anything. Um, but we never get to those. I mean, we get, we get to comfortable, you know, mushy, mossy levels kind of a thing uh but again in the bedrock if these these holes are 500 feet deep 90 900 feet deep that's a 50 story building into the ground 
you know, you're not affecting the topsoil, much less what we call the Anthropocene, <laughs> which is where humans kind of exist. Um, and the second thing I'll say is we do this in specific circuits to control and balance the load. That That is our whole key. And, and uh, I was going to, there's a, a really good example is if you think of a, of a bicycle wheel with spokes coming out of the center, the core of that bicycle, bicycle wheel is, is warmer and you have this in all wells, oil, gas, water there's what's called kind of a radius of, of interference or a radius of communication. So the closer to the point source, the more strong, the stronger the communication and the, you know, you get away and it's an exponential it has to do with thermodynamics, and Darcy flows and, and all these things that carry away the energy in a, in a dissipated manner. Um, it radiates outwards and it gets cold again. It doesn't stay in there forever. You kind of have to use the constant loads, whether it's uh, the refrigerators in the gym <laughs> that are on all night and you, and you can use that to heat and preheat. And just like in the daytime, you'll be able to kind of uh, also remove that excess heat from the building, but it doesn't get to a point where we're harming the topsoil or creating a inverse version of climate change. Uh, what we can do is monitor because it's, it's done, like I mentioned earlier with software that tracks these loads and these tonnages um, and it's, it's slots and, and you use those slots in a way that we never overcharge and never under undercharge. We optimize it. What kind of makes it cool here at Brightcore is the classic way there's softwares out there, free open source that use thermo geothermal borehole modeling as a 2d problem, a, a linear plane, infinite in all directions, uh, except into the paper, and, and that's how you you work it out, and that's how things are modeled. We have finite element, which is more along the lines of what oil and gas guys use, where you're actually measuring the data points at specific cells along the vector of, of the borehole. And we model those out, whether it's two nor'easters in a row and it's, and it's bitterly cold outside to heat waves coming into the top and what the building 8760 energy model looks like and then using utility bills and, and other things to do as accurate of a model as possible. And with the data that we have from Scandinavia, we make sure to avoid that with contingency. So that's that would be my answer. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Um, let's see. The prevailing wage, my understanding is, oh, yes, it's good that it is required. Uh, Tommy Mobley asked, how do you convince people to adopt a geothermal system if it's new and expensive? Well, we know how to get 40 up to 50% off. I know it sounds like a Black Friday deal, but that's that's just it's a 10 year horizon on the legislation. It's a bipartisan staple. We don't see it going anywhere. As Lauren mentioned, you can underwrite with it. So that's the first part. Uh, and then new. It's funny. It's new here. <laughs> it's it's not necessarily you know we didn't invent this technology a lot of this stuff is off the shelf but it's just never been put in a way where it's vertically integrated there's a lot of subcontracting and specialization where you get a driller you get a pipe fitter you get a modeler and you kind of create this marvel team of specialists to all kind of come together whereas now there's you know, companies like Brightcore that are able to kind of keep it all in-house and A, reduce cost, but B, reduce time. So we have the cost with the RA, but now it's a little bit more efficient to execute than most times. And the technology itself is very efficient. Uh, we're talking the thermal conductivity grout, the drilling mechanism uh, technology that, that I mentioned, and then the modeling software. I mean, the, the stuff that can be done now three-dimensionally, make sure you're in your footprint and if it does happen to go beyond for some reason, you can always grout back to the vertical limit of your underground lot or, or the, the extension of your lot into the subsurface. Uh, and there's such low impact at the surface that, oh, one or two extra boreholes is a couple of days. Now it can be turnkey, which is what we do. We, you know, that, that is the bread and butter is a EPC with O and M meaning uh, engineer and procure construction with operation and maintenance. Uh, so we can hand these over after the system has been commissioned. So 
there's hand holding throughout, even though it's new. And the expensive part is handled by the tax credits in a large part. They pencil out now, or sometimes they could even be financed and turned from CapEx into OpEx. But sometimes we find that budgets are easier to earmark things and then the OpEx then gather a bunch of money for an investment that was unforeseen into the CapEx for a year or two years down the line. So that's another another way that the, that the model is is changing in the industry because of these concerns. So that's a way to make it less expensive, at least uh, on, on the front end. And are the tax credits refundable? My understanding is that the tax credits for, um, can, are transferable. And there will be a secondary market for these tax credits. And we see this, whether it's nonprofits uh, or people just don't have a tax appetite uh, necessarily and use it more of an, as an asset. Um, there's there's still some clarification required on that. And then finally, uh, Joe Yi, uh, not about the equipment, but the permanent, oh, oh, sorry, that goes up to the original one. Yeah, I'm open for any other questions. Um, I'd be happy to put in my email. If anybody would like to reach out, I could put that in the chat if that's okay, Aaron. Yes, please do. Um, oh, and wonderful. Lauren did have to, to run. She put a note in the chat room uh, to say to goodbye to everyone, and, and she appreciated being here. And she will send around slides. So, um, I'll, uh, Jonathan, if you can make sure that I, I get those, I'll, I can send those out to, to all the folks here Be today happy to. so you guys can get those slides. And Jonathan just put his email there in the chat room. Um, I, I had one question. I, I did hear you mention a little bit about hot water. Are, are, are you using these same systems for hot water in a lot of your projects? So domestic hot water in passive house is possible with a typical smaller system because of the efficiency of the building. It's not necessarily the case everywhere. Gotcha. So if the envelope is not as great as passive house, um, we end up sending that to the to the space conditioning rather yeah. than the domestic hot water load. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> but for but for our all of our passive house projects, it's, it's, we it's, see it's, that. It's yeah. It's 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 too efficient. I'm kidding, uh, but no, it's 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 uh, it's it's a wonderful wonderful problem to have when it's, you know, oh well, where do we put it? Well, just put it in the water tank. You know, that's always a great place mm -hmm. to put it, and reduces loads as well. So no, we're we're excited about passive house and and the kind of the stronghold it's taking now, and with ESG commitments, uh, it's a good marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much for being here with us today and putting together the presentation and, and handling this discussion. Uh, a lot of good questions. Uh, so folks, follow up to, with Jonathan's email for, for other questions. Uh, we'll send around the, the slides here as well, and there will be a recording of this presentation made available, uh, hopefully by the end of this week, uh, on our Patch House video library, along with all of our other recordings. And I hope to see all of you in person uh, in a few weeks at our, at our symposium. Thank you uh, again. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, everyone.